I'm going to stand in front of this mic, not because I need it for my voice, because I have a very big mouth, um, but because the live stream, this goes right into the live stream. So um, welcome everybody to Peter White Public Library. My name's Marty Ackett, and I'm the adult programming coordinator for the library. Um, I do need to thank uh, the friends of Peter White Public Library. They do provide the live streaming equipment um, that we are using tonight. Um, so if you are watching online uh, tonight or after the fact, um, you have the friends uh, to thank for that, and they are a really wonderful organization that support so much of what we do here, and I couldn't do um, half of what I do without uh, the support of the friends. So I'm just going to make you aware of a few things that are upcoming next week um, and at the end of this week. Um, tomorrow night, we have a concert on the steps. <laughs> with an 80% chance of rain, um, but um, the, the Ojas are going to be here come rain or sun. Um, if it's sunny and nice, we will be outside on the steps at 7 p.m., and if it is raining, we will be inside in the community room at 7 p.m., but one way or the other, we will have a concert tomorrow night. Really excited about that. On Friday, we have our um, global cinema, um, and the uh, on Friday at noon on Friday downstairs in the community room and we're going to be showing um, Francois Truffaut's uh, 400 Blows. Um, so um, if you've never seen that, that's the movie that sort of put Francois Truffaut on the map as a filmmaker um, as, and uh, made him sort of one of the auteurs of the um, French New Wave cinema. So it's a really, really great, great film. I encourage you all to come to that. Um, next week we have a concert on the steps next Tuesday. Um, and I haven't looked at the weather because I don't want to get depressed yet. So um, we'll just say that it is going to be on the steps, and that's going to be Eddie and the Bluesers um, next Tuesday. And then next week, Friday, um, we have um, our blockbusting cinema, and we are going to be, I, I, I'm calling it blockbusting cinema throwback. It's going to be Jaws. Um, so next week, Friday at noon in the community room. So um, that's what we have coming up um, at the, uh, through the end of July. We have these programs back there that will tell you what's happening in August as well. Lots of great musical groups coming in August, including the Charlie Millard Band and the Goofy Foot Band. And if that sounds like something that you would never come to, you should come to it because they're really wonderful. Um, but let me do a little introduction. Jeff and I have known each other for... Um, 30 years, 30 some years, yeah, we went to school together, um, uh, but let me just tell you a little bit about him. Jeff teaches um, fiction writing, screenwriting, and film production at Delta College in um, Michigan. Um, his award-winning short films have been accepted over 200 times in national and international film festivals. We have to have you come back for some of your films and show some of your films, Jeff. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, his books of fiction include um, the story collection Emergency Stopping um, and uh, another one, Threatened Species. His novels include Into the Desperate Country, um, Landscape with Fragmented Figures, and American Poet. American Poet won a Michigan Notable Book Award from the Library of Michigan. Um, and in 2020, um, Whistling Shade Press released his new collection of uh, stories, uh, The Neighborhood Division Stories, and then he just published in 2022 um, his novel, uh, Rules of Order. And you can read more of his stuff at uh, his blog, which is authorjeffbandizandi.blogspot.com. So please give a big welcome to Jeff Bandizandi. Or shirt, but it's warm. <laughs> it's warm, so I'm just going to wear what I'm wearing. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks for having me, Marty. It's good seeing you again. Thanks to the Peter White Library for having me, and thank you to anybody else. I don't know names, but thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I'll start with the back row who has to be here that's my family and girl <laughs> my family and girlfriend but they're important they're filling out the room nicely and then all of you who are here voluntarily i really appreciate that <laughs> um so i i'll start by saying that i'm not i, I never studied dystopian literature as uh, in, a, in a class or anything, it was all kind of stumbling upon it on my, on my own. I, I tried tackling 1984 
um, Orwell's 1984. I was really young after my first breakup, um, and it was precipitated by the other person, not me. And I remember being on the porch and my dad walking up the stairs, and he knew what I was going through, and he's like, what are you reading? I was like, this, and I showed him 1984, and he just... It's like, that's the last thing you need while you're going through what you're going through. Because the dystopian genre is, I think, an important genre, but it's not a happy-go-lucky genre. It's kind of a, often, I think, serves as a warning as to where we might be headed. It gets its name from the opposite of a utopia, which would be a perfect place instead. This dystopia, definitely the opposite of a perfect place for various reasons. I was asked a good question by um, the woman who interviewed me for public radio up here. She said, what's the difference between post-apocalyptic literature and dystopian literature? And I, I think I spitballed a good answer, which is in a post-apocalyptic something, this is kind of a no-brainer, but something apocalyptic has to have happened, be it usually they're nuclear, you know, think Mad Max or uh, the, the like, or some kind of dramatic, climactic um, event, more, more dramatic than kind of the slow burn event that I think we're finding ourselves in currently and probably not paying enough attention to. Um, but yeah, so most, most post-apocalyptic literature is dystopian, but not all dystopians are post-apocalyptic. Um, I can get into some of the details of that. Let's see. All right. So some of the elements of the dystopian genre. Usually there is an overarching force that somehow controls most aspects of how people are conducting their lives. And I don't know how many people are familiar with 1984. I assume many in the room, but yeah, think Big Brother, think of the government control, really um, extreme surveillance. And I think there are there are there's coloring of 1984 and how we live right now. You know, there's we don't think about it, but walking down the street, somewhere we're on a camera, somewhere we're on a screen, we're being surveilled, how much we're on the internet, etc. So it's kind of you know these. The best dystopian writers are very prophetic. I mean, they can kind of see what's, what's coming. Um, but usually, yeah, there's some kind of force. Typically, that force portrays itself as, well, this is the way it has to be. This is the only way we can function. So they almost try to portray themselves as a utopia. But because of the rules and the way it's kind of anti-human, usually, and it's uh, the way it plays out, um, it's definitely, there's nothing utopian about it, even if, you know, the, the powers behind Big Brother would, would portray it that way. Typically in these books, the protagonist has some kind of awakening. Usually in the first chapter, there's a, an awareness dawns upon them of like, this is not the way we should be living. And oftentimes, think uh, Guy Montag from Fahrenheit 451, they're often steeped within the system. I mean, Fahrenheit 451, if you haven't read it, you know, uh, Guy Montag is a fireman, except firemen burn books. They don't put out fires. They are controlling people's access to, to knowledge, et cetera. And he has an awakening because he actually reads a book. And, and he can't make heads or tails of it, but it feels important to him and he starts to question the very thing that he's involved in. And that's a pretty typical trope in the dystopian genre. And then the protagonist usually works to somehow subvert the overarching force. And this is a sad part of the genre. They almost always fail. And it kind of makes sense because this, this force that's making people live the way they are, it's huge. And it's gone on for years. So it's probably not enough just to have two or three voices questioning it. I think for a big change to come, it takes a lot of people to decide we're not gonna live this way anymore. But I think challenging how we live is also makes people fearful. So we kind of even stay in patterns that are not the best for us. And I think we're in one right now. Uh, there is a, I think it's called, instead of 
sci-fi, there is a new genre out there called cli-fi, which is about climate. And, and a lot of them are dystopian in nature too, except what's happening is what's you know, going on with, with uh, the environment. Things I like about the dystopian genre, um, I think they're, the authors tend to be refreshingly overt in their messaging. Um, I, I remember taking a lot of literature classes at Northern where you'd sit for three hours and somebody who had a PhD in that particular uh, genre would explain to you what you just read. But you didn't get it yourself. You'd go to class to kind of be told, or at least the best teachers would lead you there to, and like, okay, now I kind of get it, but it seems that we were here for three hours and we're finally kind of getting the message. I, I sometimes find, um, and you're not supposed to be heavy handed, I guess, writing contemporary literature. Uh, otherwise people say, well, why don't you just write an essay then if you have something that you feel you have to say. I think dystopian writers do come right out, but they come, I think, from a fear of where the world is headed. Orwell feared totalitarianism and things that he saw coming. Bradbury feared you know, uh, the decline of intellect and the loss of books. I mean, one of the points he makes in Fahrenheit 451 is they didn't really need firemen all that badly. Most people weren't reading anyway. They didn't care, they were happy. And there's a lot, if you read Fahrenheit 451, you can see a lot of us in it, people's fascination with technology, the, you know, the, the woman who's married to Guy Montag, she wants a, to have a parlor, the living room, and all the walls be television screens. And they would even send you scripts in the mail, and then you could actually be a character in the, in the TV show. The characters on TV would respond to what the script said that you should say. And she actually called the people in the walls, in the shows, her family. She was closer to them, she felt, than she was to her husband. Um, so that's, and I mean, he's writing this in the late 40s, early 50s. How to bear, it's, we're so used to not only everybody having a TV in their home, but having multiple TVs. And he's writing this at a time where maybe 10 to 15% of people have a television in their house, but they, they tend to be futurists and they can kind of see where things are headed and they're fearful. And I do think they write out of a, even though they're writing dark stuff, they write out of a love for humankind. They want us to take the warning of their message and change our ways. Um, so as I said here, it's futurism, but with a concern for the present. Usually dystopians take something that we have going on now, and then they turn the volume way up on it. And it's, it's supposed to make you reflect on, on your world and how we're living. Um, so this, what I'm going to share with you is by no means complete, but you might get, I mean, there's, there, could be, there could be books in here that you haven't read. It, it, maybe the goal of this is that you get a little bit of a reading list if you want to delve into the dystopian genre a little bit more. So, of course, for many people, their first exposure is off in 1984, Orwell's classic, written in 1949. Talked about that a little bit already with Big Brother and totalitarianism, et cetera. That was my first exposure. Um, honestly, I didn't probably get much out of it when I was reading it at 19, but I reread it again in my 30s, and yeah, he's doing pretty incredible stuff in there. I do think I find 1984 a little bit long in the tooth, but I mean, who am I to critique Orwell? <laughs> this is when I really, I mean, this book blew me away. I probably reread Fahrenheit 451 a, you know, once every couple of years. Um, and that was written in 1953, that's Ray Bradbury, and we talked about that a little bit, the, the firemen, et cetera, and the loss of intellect and people really kind of not being aware of what's happening in the world. It made him fearful how disengaged people were from reality. Um, but we're not, we're actually getting farther ahead in date as far as trying to trace again what is, because that became a question for me, what was the first dystopian book? And it's clearly not this, because this was written after 84. I, for the longest time, thought 1984 was the first dystopian novel. Clockwork Orange was one I read. Um, in this case, Burgess is very fearful of the kind of exaltation of violence and the desensitization, 
how desensitized young people seem to be. Um, and this, I mean, there was a, Burgess dealt with it by writing this book, but I mean, his, I mean, it's a gr grim story, but his home was broken into and his wife was sexually assaulted in front of him um, by a, a gang of young men. Um, and this is how he kind of tried to deal with it through this book. Um, it was made into a movie and he softened to it later in life, but Burgess hated the movie. He thought it did exactly what he worried was happening. It, it actually seemed to glorify the violence and it almost made the violent main character too appealing. And he felt young people were watching it because they were getting off on watching the violence too, like they were missing the message. Um, of course, this has become a series now. Uh, Margaret Atwood's hand, the, her novel, The Handmaid's Tale, written in 1985, so obviously we're not getting closer to the source, but her book is be in, in the series, et cetera, with the erosion of women's rights and what we see happening now. She was predicting a lot of that in this book. It's a, another powerful read. Then I realized, oh, this predated 1984. Huxley's Brave New World, written in 1932. So then I thought, okay, I, I've, I've found the source. Fascinating, fascinating book. Um, yeah, when uh, 1984 was published, um, Orwell sent Huxley a copy of it, and Huxley read it, and basically said, like, I found your book really cute. <laughs> However, I think I already kind of got it right in Brave New World as, as to what's going to happen. And he was... I mean, Brave New World, they, they basically, they have these birthing centers. Nobody is having birth anymore by natural, like it's all done in test tubes and people are actually bred for certain kinds of labor. So people would be, if, they, if we could breed, there, there's a group in there called the semi-morons and they're built for a specific kind of work that they won't get bored with um, because they were bred not to get bored with it. And there are elites, though, and you would think the elites would be the happy people, but one of the, one of the themes that's throughout Brave New World is there's this, this drug called Soma. And Soma, is, I mean, basically you just take it to escape depressive feelings. And characters are taking it left and right in the book. So something is still amiss even in this utopia where everybody should be happy because they'd all be happy with the kind of work that they're doing. So another really good read. Um, then I came across this, um, we, and this is the first dystopian or so I thought for a long time, written in 1924 uh, by Russian Yevgeny Zamyatin. And here's a little description of it. Uh, the exhilarating dystopian novel that inspired George Orwell's 1984, both Orwell and Huxley accused each other of ripping off we. Uh, George Orwell's 1984 and a precursor to the work of Philip K. Dick and Stanislaw Lem and foreshadowed the worst excesses of Soviet Russia. The novel describes a world of harmony and conformity within a united totalitarian state. The story of the 30th century is set in the one state, a society where all live for the collective good and individual freedom does not exist. The novel takes the form of the diary of state mathematician D-503, who, to his shock, experiences the most disruptive emotion imaginable, love for another human being. We is the classic dystopian novel and was the forerunner of works such as George Orwell's 1984 and Huxley's Brave New World. It was suppressed for many years in Russia and remains a resounding cry for individual freedom, yet is also a powerful, exciting, and vivid work of science fiction. So I thought I had it with we, but then I found it at least according to Google, the first, and I did not believe who wrote it. It's a book called The Iron Heel, written in 1907. I read him when I was young, but I always associated him as a nature writer. He wrote Call of the Wild, um, White Fang. Yeah, it was actually Jack London who wrote The Iron Heel. And I was shocked at how many books and how many different genres Jack London actually experimented in. I always assumed he was just a nature writer, but he was, he was also a socialist, very interested in politics, et cetera. And so The Iron Heel is a very interesting read. Another book of his, uh, 
written in 1915 called The Scarlet Plague, and it predicts a plague that comes and wipes out most of humanity, I think, in the, like the year 2019. So, yeah, yeah. That's where he set the Scarlet Plague. And I, uh, I say a possible utopian because I think in tongue-in-cheek, there's an old man who survived it, and he's with his grandsons on, on the shore, and they're collecting clams to eat, and he's t telling them about what life used to be like. And he's, he's describing it very wistfully, like, like almost a gone with the wind, kind of, oh, where did those days go? And you kind of realize as a reader, like, I guess those days really weren't as great as we thought compared to this kind of simple down-to-the-bone living that we see the grandsons doing, which is simply collecting food. They have a much more natural relationship to the world than, than what um, the class system of you know, upper class, middle class, lower class that just always kind of tends to divide us anyway. So that's another, and it's a quick read. I'd say it's a novella, not a novel. It's, it's pretty short, but interesting. Interestingly, it was utopian first. Thomas More in 1516 wrote Utopia. Um, and it says here, Sir Thomas More was the first person to write of a quote-unquote utopia, a word used to describe a perfect imaginary world. More's book imagines a complex, self-contained community set on an island in which people share a common culture and way of life. He coined the word utopia from the Greek utopos, meaning no place or nowhere. It was a pun. The almost identical Greek word utopos means a good place. So at the very heart of the world is a vital question. Can a perfect world ever be realized? It is unclear as to whether the book is a serious projection of a better way of life or a satire that gave more a platform from which to discuss the chaos of European politics. Uh, another interesting utopian work written by a psychologist, B.F. Skinner, that I very much enjoyed, Walden II, where they try to create a perfect society. And when you read it, you're kind of like, at least my reaction to it was, that doesn't sound so bad. Um, and the sadness in the book is kind of the guy who created the, the whole book is him walking people around this perfect society that he has created. And he's kind of He's kind of bragging about it, and he realizes by the end that he's exhibiting a lot of the things that this perfect society wouldn't have, like pride. And so he realizes, I'll never actually be able to be a part of the creation that I created because I still carry the values of the old world, and I take pride in what I created here, which you would never experience with anybody living here. They don't know what pride is they do, because of the way they were conditioned. And you do get the sense, like, I, at least I do when I read Walden too, like maybe that, maybe that could actually make life better. But I leave that up to you if you choose to read it or maybe you already have. What's that? Do you want to hear that one came out? That one I don't, um, but I think in the 60s. 50s. 50s? Okay. Somewhere. Uh, it was, but it was after World War II for sure. Uh, this is an interesting book too. There is a history of people trying to create utopian micro-societies in America. Uh, unfortunately, many of them end up being cults. Um, but they try, and the history of that, this, this book, American Utopias, I don't know whether or not you'd have it in Peter White's library. It's, it's fairly, fairly well known, but that's worth checking out if you want to read about real life attempts of people trying to create utopias. Think in the 60s, communes, et cetera. I mean, there's been some attempts at communes even in the UP, small communities choosing to live a certain way, et cetera. All right. So after some attempts at short stories with dystopian themes um, and then a novella that I had come out that was dystopian, um, I wrote this book, uh, Rules of Order which actually is one of my short stories expanded. It, it came to me that I wasn't really done with that story. I'm going to take a risk. Um, normally, I just read the first chapter. And I'm, I've done this presentation now at about seven libraries. Um, I'm sick of the first chapter. <laughs> Alicia is sick of the first chapter. 
But the risk being, I'm going to dive into the middle of the book, but maybe that, if it raises questions, maybe that intrigues you as to wanting to know more. And then there's a means right up here <laughs> for you to know more. And this is no dystopia. These are only $10 a piece. So it's almost utopian and it's... Jeff. Yes. Yeah, I think that the dystopian genre can share, uh, you know, ideas and values with other works like that. I think where it, where it probably wouldn't be classified as dystopian is because it just, it's just not set in the future, and typically they are. So, but I think it has a lot of the same kind of ideas going on. They're, they do create kind of a little micro society and try to survive their circumstances, and, and they end up creating kind of a dystopia of their own. But... Um, but so I'm going to read the description and hopefully that sets the makes it so you can get into something that I'm going to start reading from page 119 but rules of order tells the story of Harvey Crow a community activist who lives in what could be the last remaining high-rise building in a wrecked city um, cracks in the ground floor apartments are appearing exponentially the building's structural strength can't possibly hold the load it bears. Crow works to inform tenants on the upper floors that the weight of their possessions could bring the entire building down. Working with the Anti-Collapse Trust, or ACT, Crow encounters obstacles to his message, including indifferent tenants, his self-doubt, hostile security guards, and a co-op board headed by the corrupt Chairman Burke. Even as Crow makes meaningful alliances, with other influential tenants, he can feel the way they are working against a ticking clock. With time running out, Crow and his militant colleague, Dagmar, carry out a desperate plan to save what might be the city's last habitable space. So you have to imagine a high-rise building. You can't, I mean, the, the climate is so wrecked they can't leave the building. It's kind of hermetically sealed. There are these uh, automated farms and automated factories that are still delivering goods to the building, but essentially there's nowhere for them to go, so their actual home is, is under threat of collapsing. Um, so where I'm going to read from is Crow was just up on an upper floor. He was trying to talk to somebody. He had a door slammed in his face, and right at this moment he realizes that security guards are coming off of an elevator and seeing him on a floor that he's not supposed to be on. So, down the hall, the guest elevator dinged its arrival. Two security guards stepped off the lift and looked directly at him. Their expression said he was who they'd been hoping to find. Some 300 feet away, they bolted in his direction. On instinct, he ran, letting Mrs. Montgomery's flyer loose from his fingers and fluttering to the floor. Reaching it, he mashed his sweating palm into the freight elevator's call button. The men were cutting the distance quickly. Stay right there. Shit, Crow hissed, dashing for the fire door. In the stairwell, he slammed his body into the security gates and took the stairs two at a time, grabbing at railings and careening off walls. He could hear them pounding behind and gaining on him. Had Lamarck called them after he left? His lungs burned. His legs simmered with growing exhaustion. The floor numbers flashed by on the fire doors, 39, 38, 37. And behind him, the sounds of hammering feet getting louder and louder. With six steps left to each flight, he began leaping down to the next landing, suspecting that his pursuers were doing the same. He gulped breaths. Were they gaining? Were they falling behind? 
the echo chamber of the stairwell reverberating with the piston rhythm of their feet against metal and concrete gave nothing away. He could imagine their hands reaching out for him, their fingertips inches away from his tie flapping over his shoulder like a tail. Periodically, the voice of a dispatcher came echoing from one of the security guard's shoulder radios. Sus 84 floor apprehended. He couldn't discern the words, but knew that the ghostly static-filled voice was getting closer to him, which meant the guards were getting closer too. The fire door for the 21st floor flashed by. An idea came to him. Reaching the 20th floor, he pushed open the fire door, closed it as quickly as he could, and sprinted with what he had left down the hallway. He didn't look back, didn't want to know. The air in his chest felt cold, and he coughed up a mouthful of phlegm, the resin lining his lungs, breaking free from the exertion, some vile residue from all the years of breathing the air of the lower floors. With no air to spit, he swallowed it into his empty stomach. He found the double doors he was looking for, PS 20. He ran past an empty reception desk, past partition walls dividing the large space up into separate rooms. There were last names on plastic signs on the doorways to each makeshift room. Then he saw it, Simmons. He stopped right outside the doorway, bent over, catching his breath. He peered back over the distance he'd come from. They weren't behind him, not yet. Then what he was doing occurred to him. Pursued by security guards, he ran into a public school. What was he even thinking? He was going to hide among children, make them witness him being tackled, subdued, or worse, put them in danger. He was risking getting Sarah involved, a woman he barely knew. The guards would want to know why he went to her. No, he thought, I can't. He looked back in the direction from where he'd come. Still, nobody. No commotion at all. He could leave. He had to leave. What are you doing? He looked up at Sarah Simmons. Behind her, through the doorway, her class was seated at desks, their heads bent to some worksheet. He panted. I thought, I, I thought you could use a guest, a guest speaker. Study skills. He tried to smile. She looked, she looked him over with concern. Her eyes were too kind for him to lie. No, somebody's after me. It's, I can go. I'm just going to go. She put her hand on his shoulder and guided him into the room where he wedged himself into an empty desk near the back. Get your breath, she said. She walked to the front of the room. A handful of students stole glances over their shoulders, and a few that he tutored offered smiles and jerky little waves with their hands, even as their puzzled eyes worried about him. He forced smiles and waved back. Your eyes should only be on your quizzes, Mrs. Simmons said. Her voice was different, stern, one used for keeping order. She came back and set a box of tissue on Crow's desk. You're sweaty, she said, smiling. After glancing outside of her room, she returned to the front, never once looking at her desk, but instead surveying the students. Crow pulled tissues from the box. He mopped his forehead, his neck, his face. The whole time his eyes were on the doorway, but nobody came through. I lost them, he whispered to himself, stifling a chilled cough that would plague him for the next hour. When the students finished their quizzes, Mrs. Simmons collected them. She made no mention of their visitor and only scolded, never you mind, when they looked back at him. On her screen, she projected images, timelines, and dates covering a period of more recent history known as the ozone precaution. Crow observed her in the way her heart had clearly been called to the profession. She moved seamlessly from lecture to having them discuss in groups, to having a larger discussion with the entire group. She took them seriously and treated them with respect, and in turn, they offered the same to her. It was something that the worst teachers missed. Crow had had plenty of them through his schooling. Phone it in or betray your apathy for the task at hand, and you were finished as far as the students were concerned. Students only needed to know that you had a passion for the subject and a desire for them to learn it. It was never about discipline or order. With the right environment, those came naturally. 
It was a combination of expertise, humility, and excitement for the material, reverence for the learned and the learners, a varied approach, and genuine acknowledgement of their successes and their missteps. She had it all, and he watched her for hours as though she were a magician. With pride, he observed Luke and Tim participating. They'd offer something to the discussion. Mrs. Simmons would praise them, and despite her warnings, they'd glance back at Crow. He offered them quick approval in the gesture of a raised thumb, but with a spin of his finger, they'd turn their attention back to the front. It wasn't lost on him that Mrs. Simmons was aware, and he offered her an apologetic shrug if they made eye contact. She smiled in return to accept his apology. With only 45 minutes left in the school day, Mrs. Simmons finally invited Crow to the front of the room. Before then, at least one of the school's administrators had looked into the room and had given him a confused stare. Mrs. Simmons had noticed, and when she did invite him to the front of the room, she inter introduced him as a guest speaker on study skills. We have that exam coming up when we meet again next week, she said. It covers the last three chapters, and with that, Mr. Crow here is going to help you with strategies for synthesizing all of that information. She'd put him on the spot. Regardless, he quickly fell back on the same strategies he'd been using in his group tutoring sessions. By the time other, another administrator looked in the room, Crow was in full swing and seemed as legitimate as any other guest speaker. The administrator stood in the doorway for a time and eventually nodded his head in approval before leaving. When the class ended, a few of Crow's students talked with him, but only briefly, clearly eager to be free of the schoolroom. Mrs. Simmons gathered up her materials and grading books. They walked out together, saying nothing. Aside from some lingering kids, the hallway was empty. Walking about 500 feet, she stopped in front of an apartment door. This is me, she said. He nodded. Thank you for, I think you should come in for a bit, she said, turning her key in the lock. If they saw you going into the school, they probably know when school is out. They might be waiting for you. She opened the door and gestured him in. The one-bedroom apartment was sparsely furnished with no decorations or knickknacks. Even the walls were bare of pictures. She had a futon sofa with a coffee table in front of it. On the table sat a single book. Once they had pets, a history of domesticated animals. Please sit down, she said. When she returned from the kitchen, she set down a bottle of Just Like Water for each of them. Opening the container, he recalled the water in Mrs. Montgomery's apartment. He shook his head. Just Like Water was only like water in appearance. It ran slowly and thick down the throat like syrup, like swallowing a greased length of rope. Even if left in refrigeration for days, it never cooled below lukewarm. Still, it quenched thirst and didn't taste of rusted metals. He thought of the marketing copy he'd written for Just Like Water. Doesn't taste of rusted metals might have been the most positive and accurate thing he could have written about it had he been allowed to be honest. It wasn't honesty but advertising that made Just Like Water the most popular water substitute. Far outselling Water Now and What Are You Waiting For? So who was chasing you? He told her about going to talk to Lamarck and then what happened in the hallway afterward. I don't know, they just seemed intent. Usually the security guards will chase you off the floor and they're satisfied. These guys followed me down 30 flights of stairs. He apologized. I shouldn't have come to the school, but I guess I was a little spooked. He pointed to the fading bruises on his face. I had visitors the other night. They were sending a message. He looked into her eyes. I swear I wouldn't have gone near the school if I thought it was anybody besides guards behind me. You, you were beat up? He nodded. There are people who don't care for my activism. Sarah leaned forward and slid the book from the coffee table into her lap. Opening it, she took out the bookmark. The page she turned to had an old photograph of a woman with an animal sitting next to her on a couch. It looked similar to the wolves he'd seen in the zoo documentary. It still struck him as odd that people had once lived that way. Is this you, she asked, handing him the piece of paper she'd been using as a bookmark. Did you write this? It was a flyer, 
what you don't know about the exoskeleton. He nodded. You're a very good writer. She pointed around her sparsely decorated apartment. You're a very convincing writer, as you can see. She took the paper from him, set it back in her book, and then set the volume back on the table. This, I mean, living like this with, with nothing, this is to reduce the load? He asked, gesturing toward the apartment. He flipped his palms up sympathetically and then set his hands back on his knees. I, I didn't want to ask. I didn't know how much teachers make. She laughed. No, I could have more than this. I'm just trying to make a difference, you know. I teach history, and you won't find one book in my apartment besides the few I have checked out from the library. She, puts her, she put her hands to her cheeks and exhaled. It wasn't easy, but I brought my collection to the refuse ramp about six months ago. He raised his eyebrows. That's commitment. She touched the bruise under his left eye and then retracted her hand. I think this is commitment. He smiled. Well, you might be the only person who read my material and did anything. He thought of Mrs. Montgomery. Well, maybe you're among a handful. I'm just not sure that's worth the beating I took. He thought back to the sizzling backhands and shuddered. She said if history had taught her anything, it was that it can take a long time for people to change, but they do change. History is the study of how we changed. Just keep putting your message out. Give it time. It's not like I read your first pamphlet and immediately started living lighter. Well, isn't some of history about how we failed to change? She nodded. That too, but that usually still ends with some kind of change. He thought of Dagmar. I'm, not, I'm just not sure we have a lot of time for the change to happen. You think something could happen soon? He told her that the language in his literature was watered down. It's a fine line. It has to be palatable. People won't read anything that sounds over the top. But if I wrote what I think needs to be written with the right urgency, it would just fuel the conspiracy theory talk. And any thinking person like yourself would just weep. He set his head back on the futon's cushion. I don't know. I don't even know what I don't know. Sighing, he turned toward her. I don't want to talk about the building right now, if that's okay. Aside from spending time in your class and now with you, it's been a pretty bad day. I should head home. She put her hand on his wrist. I don't think you should just yet. She took her hand away. Let me make you dinner. She laughed. It's the least I can do considering the free seminar you gave my students today. Well, I didn't have breakfast or lunch. He nodded. I could eat, Mrs. Simmons. She smiled. Please call me Sarah. In the kitchen, she rehydrated lasagna and corn and put out bread with margarine. Taking it from a top shelf, she poured a box of powdered wine into a carafe mixed with just like water and rusty tap water and stirred it until it became Merlot. They sat at her small kitchen table. Sarah held a tightly meshed strainer over his glass while pouring from the carafe. It's a little less chewy this way, she said. <laughs> the conversation turned quickly to their lives. Sarah was living on the same floor she'd grown up on, teaching at the same school she'd attended. Both of her parents had been teachers at the school. They still lived on 20 as well. Their apartment was only several hundred feet from hers. Dedicating her life to teaching, she'd never tried to meet anyone. Most of the men I meet talk about wanting children. The way they talked, it seemed like they assumed I would eventually get married, quit my job, and raise children at home. For me, it's always been enough to devote myself to the children in my classes. He nodded. Me? I fell into tutoring out of necessity, but sometimes I'll be in the middle of it and it'll hit me that I'm doing something I was born to do. She raised her glass to him. As I said, you are good. They touched their glasses together and each took a sip. He felt a calm looking into her eyes. There was a depth and caring there. He told her about the marketing for Just Like Water and how he had lived on the 26th floor for a time. I went to college for acting, but ended up in marketing. He mentioned how the stage theaters below the 70th floor had largely vanished, and with that, any real chance of him acting. The work for Just Like Water never meant anything to me, but I was good at it. It gave me a life and things I was supposed to want, but at some point I realized I never really wanted those things to begin with. He told her about his parents. 
My father worked on the maintenance crew. He used to grumble about shortcuts they were taking, short-sighted decisions the board was making. At the time, I wrote him off as a hard-working but bitter, hyperbolic man. I felt it was, it was an unfortunate symptom of being uneducated. The truth is one becomes blind to wisdom because you doubt the intelligence of the source. Turns out he was on to something. She reached across the table and squeezed his hand. It must have been difficult to lose your parents when you were so young. He squeezed her hand back and the warmth in her palm washed into his. It was a turning point, I know that much. Still, there's a degree of acting to what I do. Standing at people's doors or tutoring, there's performance involved as much as anything. That's true, same with teaching. They stood side by side at her sink. She handed him dripping plates or silverware and he dried them. Flexing his wound, wound reddened hand, wounded reddened hand in the air in front of him, he told her about his visit to Lamarck. Uh, and the guy had slammed the door on him and caught his hand in the door. It sounds like you missed your calling as a door-to-door -door salesman. That's quite a technique to keep the sales pitch going over crushed fingers, she said, laughing. Hey, he said, smiling himself. Putting away the casserole pan, which was the last of the dishes, he closed the cupboard. She stood for a moment, staring into the frosted window of her kitchen. The gray beyond the glass was ever-present. It sometimes feels like we haven't learned anything from the past, she said. Without turning on any lights, they sat for some time on the futon in the darkness of the living room. His hand found hers, and they laced their fingers together. Their honest human talk was like divination, and he felt it summoning a contentedness in him he hadn't felt in a long time, if ever. In time, their talk drifted back to the fate of the building. I don't think people are inherently evil or selfish, she said. We just seem to have a hardwired stubbornness for rationalizing our own beliefs and behaviors. I have a friend, Crow started, who thinks we could have as little as five months. Even if that's exaggerated, it's coming. Honestly, I don't think anyone can do anything about it. She was quiet for a moment. I hadn't heard anything that dire, she whispered. I believe it is that dire. They went silent, and as though the heaviness they'd talked into the air suppressed the ability for any more words. Crow stood up. I think I should be going. She told him she didn't think he should, just to be safe. She stood then and started to convert the futon into a bed. He didn't argue. He didn't want to go back to his empty apartment. She brought him a sheet, and while she left to find a blanket, he undressed and climbed into the cool cocoon of her linen. She draped the blanket over him, when she returned, then left without a word back into her bedroom. He waited, but she didn't come back. He shook his head. He'd been too morose. What did he know? Would it be five months? Could it be a year? Maybe the building would never come down. Maybe all of Ack's funereal predictions were the stuff of paranoia and gloom that others always said they were. And here he'd ruined a good evening with his words, again, as always. Now he lay on her couch, a guest of pity. I can't stay here, he thought, and made to throw the bed covers off of himself when Sarah emerged again into the living room. She was wearing a white nightgown, looking like a ghost in the low light. May I lie with you? He stared at her for a moment. I may be with someone. She paused in her approach. What? He put his head back on the pillow and looked up into the darkness of the ceiling. I don't know. There's another woman... It could be there's nothing there. I just wanted you to know. She folded back the blanket and sheet and climbed in with him. I don't want to sleep alone. I don't think I've ever been more afraid in my life. He scooted closer to her and pressed the warmth of his chest against the heat of her back. She reached for his arm and draped it over her. Their fingers braided again and nestled between her breasts. The night pressed heavy against the window, and they lay together as though buoyed by a raft on that darkling plain. Thank you. I'm not sure if there are questions or not. I have a question for you, though, as the people who sat through that. Is that okay to read, or do you feel lost if I'm jumping in the middle like that? Okay. All right. Are there any questions? 
are there books for sale? Yes, there are. <laughs> Whoever said I appreciate the question. How much? They're $10 a piece. So, all right, got that out of the way. So if there are any other questions. Uh, now, actually, the next book is a, I wrote, when we got sent home for the pandemic, I wrote Rules of Order, the first draft of it in five weeks, because I was home waiting for student emails to come in, and um, they weren't coming, I mean, if you remember those, I think we've largely tried to block them out, but those opening weeks of the pandemic, it was so frightening. We had six weeks left of the semester. And I just remember every morning sending my students just kind of begging emails, like, just send this in and you'll pass. <laughs> and I just send in your story. I don't care if it's six pages. You'll pa and they, you know, oftentimes I'd sit for a day and might get two emails back from, you know, might be 70 to 80 students. So I started writing Rules of Order, and uh, I wrote that in five weeks and then spent the summer editing it and revising it. And then in the fall, we were all online teaching again, and I had an idea for a gothic horror, so I wrote another. So I wrote two novels in 2020, and then I haven't written a damn word since because I think it took all my words away. <laughs> but yes, and that book called uh, The Dance of Rotten Sticks is going to come out from the same press at some point. But was there another question? Um, I have not. Do you have any recommendations? Hunger Games. Hunger Games, of course. Yeah, that's and that has, I think, did a lot to put the genre on the map even more. And now, where I think probably in the 80s there were far less dystopian books, it really blew up, partly because I think people saw it was a money-making genre too, especially the young adult um, dystopians. Station 11? Station 11, yep. Mm -hmm. Uh... I have not read, I read Hunger Games to my son. I have not read Station Eleven, but I've heard good things. In the 90s or something, The Girl Who Owned a City came out, and you might like it. What's it called? The Girl Who Owned a City. The Girl Who Owned a City? It sounds, oh, in some ways. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so, again, that's why I call this an incomplete history. I mean, I'm just kind of going from my own experience, and there's probably, as we're sitting here, 500 people working on a dystopian somewhere in the world. They won't all be good, but some will be published. At Station Eleven, I don't know. I didn't read it, but I watched it on uh, on series and things. I don't know if you've seen it. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. I, it, I, it was no, very good. Yeah. I just I don't know. I didn't see the tranquility or whatever. But, oh wait a minute. There's two other books to read, and so I wrote read Station Eleven, and then just today, the Last Hotel came in for me to pick up. Oh, nice. Okay. Another dystopian series was uh, Snowpiercer. I don't know if and I, I don't know if that's a series or a movie, or maybe it was a movie and a series. But yeah, I mean that all. Yeah, but that all takes place on a train racing around the world, and there's a whole the whole class thing too. Uh, back of the train is I think the lower class, and the front of the train, and yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. I don't ever think, and because I teach screenwriting too, I'll tell my students that like when they say the book was better, I'll usually say, of course it was, because you're saying you're comparing a book to a movie, and you're asking the question, what was a better book? Only the book can be, you know. But the movies do. I just think it's. I think it's very challenging to adapt a book into a movie. Uh, I think there are. There are aspects to Clockwork Orange that are incredibly well done. I did not really, I think a, a new Fahrenheit 451 could be made that would be, I think there were some changes in the movie, the one that you mentioned. And there's also some absences, like the absence of the mechanical hound, which I think is integral. 
And you, I think they made a, a Fahrenheit 451 series too. Um, but it was like with memes, it was like social media, I think was, but again, the hound wasn't in that. And I think that the hound is, is important of a kind of the totalitarian, the government will get you if you do act out of line kind of thing. But I appreciate the movies, but again, um, uh, for me, the, they can never quite delve into the depth that you get. And so much has to be cut from a book to adapt it into a movie or make it work for, for film. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but um, I, I'll watch them with interest, but it's, the, it's definitely the books. I don't know that a movie could be made that would hold up to Fahrenheit 451, the book. I'm thinking of Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis from Simon's era. Right. Yeah. Terry. You mentioned uh, self doubt as a common theme in oh. general in dystopian That's literature. Six. The library will be closing in 30 minutes at 8 30. That's Big Brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big Sister. Hey, we had a sample from your reading where the protagonist is laying down and I'm trying to settle down and the self doubt comes creeping in. What is that? role mean for you for in this dystopian literature as a kind of internal dramatic element or kind of maybe in a theoretical fictional sense what's the role of the self doubt of the protagonist like what is the significant i think it's a human i don't know i Maybe there are people that operate with complete conviction and know absolutely what they're doing, but I think self-doubt is, and maybe it's just a part of me coming out in the character, but I do think we question with conviction, especially I think in this, our particular era that we're in right now with the misinformation and the disinformation and whatnot, you almost, there are times where I'll, I'll read online and somebody's talking about, no, the climate hasn't changed that much. And if you look at the history of temperatures, the temperature goes up. And, and there's a part of me that, like, I kind of want to believe they're right. I, I kind of really doubt it. But it would be such a relief to just not have to worry about the world. To not, like, yeah, they're probably right. This climate change is a hoax. I know it's not. But I think, yeah, that, that comes in, too. I think almost as a relief. I don't think... Crow wants to carry the burden of the building. He doesn't want to be among a handful of people who know that they're that they're on a path to destruction. That's a heavy weight to bear. You know, I hear from people who say, I don't watch the news. I don't want to be aware. And I can understand that point of view, and I'm getting closer there myself. But I also know then, like in Fahrenheit 451, if you're not paying attention, things can happen that will affect you later. I don't know if that answered the whole self-doubt question, but I, I just think that's a human trait that even as, even as we are entrenched in a cause, we might doubt that we're going to make a difference. We might doubt if it's the difference that needs to be made, et cetera. Oh, question. Yes. Right, right. So there seems to be an element of, of hope sometimes in dystopian literature or post-apocalyptic literature that, you know, but I guess it's going to happen to us in the world as, as the society falls apart with climate change over time that, you know, eventually the world will remake itself in some new shape. It inevitably has to, you know, nature. Right. You can't stop nature from adapting or, or re-emerging re, re, re at some point, so... What, what do you, what do you, how do you view, uh, do you view dystopian literature as ultimately optimistic or, or pessimistic? Um, I don't find it particularly happy-go-lucky as far as, at least a lot of the dystopian, there is hope for the human spirit that there are people who will look at what's happening and say, no, this is wrong, I'm going to do something about it. They'll, the lack of hope in that is I think there's just not enough people who do. 
that it can't change can't come about because five or six people decide that the world's not right the way it's set up um yeah the the movie the road takes it a little bit further because as as you know it life is supposedly like all animals and whatnot have died after the after the the nuclear war but at the end of the movie i think he picks up a can and a beetle flies out of it too which is not in the book he is taken in by a family at the end of the book but there's not that reference so yeah i don't know i don't know if mccarthy felt kind of pain. he'd written a pretty bleak book pretty bleak is a, it's a very fair description of really like a incredibly depressing book and i almost think he felt at the end some like i gotta give him something and i gave i think he gave us too much i didn't quite buy the ending just because of everything that was displayed throughout i i didn't get a whole lot of sense that i didn't find it super believable that he would find this idyllic family who agreed to raise him only because the book didn't i mean i think you have to foreshadow that that's a possibility and everybody almost everybody they encountered in that book was terrible and almost cannibalistic so i do think it's important i guess to offer some hope i do think rules of order ends on a cautiously optimistic note that you know if people persevere they can make a difference but there will all be uh, always be the forces of greed and opportunism that are that will make us act terribly or at least some of us did you have a question as well oh, i was going to ask you if uh, that collapse of the florida apartment building had anything to do with the beginning of your book well i had written and it's in the neighborhood division i had written a short story called load and that was what rules of order was adapted from or expanded from and i I know I wrote load before that that building collapse had happened in Florida, so I that's just to say I, I wasn't inspired by that particular event. I don't remember where the idea for the story came from. But that's you know, that if you look into that history, that didn't have to happen either. There was there was greed there, there was cutting corners there. As 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 often the source of our tragedies, it's often money. You know, the haves having and the have not suffering as a result of having not. How has your dad influenced your writing? Well, he was, you know, there was always writing in the house. Um, I remember watching cartoons on a Saturday and, you know, my mom coming and say, you have to turn that down, your dad's writing. And you could hear, you know, the, so as I'm watching cartoons, it's kind of soundtracked by these clacking typewriter keys. For the longest time, I thought oh, that's what dads did. Like, <laughs> they write on Saturdays. <laughs> then I found out he was just kind of an oddball. But, but I don't know. That's the best way to go through the world, I think, is a bit of an oddball. He wrote, I have not read, I mean, obviously I've read Night Driving. Um, he wrote a number of novels, and I don't know that he was meant to. I think he should have stayed with short stories. I think it was his genre, but I think he was under a lot of pressure from agents that, you know, there's more money to be made in a novel. And I think, you know, if you ever, you know, spent time with my dad or knew him, he was a storyteller. And if, I mean, the, the most dangerous thing you could do is give him more time because he could fill it <laughs> and he could keep going. And that's, I think the novel gave him too much time. I forget what writers said. All writers start out being poets, failing that, become short story writers, failing that, become novelists. And each gives you more freedom. And in length, you can bury lack of talent. Where in a poem, it's such a small canvas, it's clear pretty quickly that you're not a very good poet. Not you, but the royal you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, he was a. I mean, he was a fascinating person as a writer. I remember him writing. He would open it up and he would type Faulkner stories, word for word, 
And people would ask, why do you do that? He goes, I wanted to know what it felt like to write sentences like that because they were so blown away by Faulkner's style and ability. I, I've never wa saw your dad type, but um, I want to give Jeff time to sell some books. Oh, that, that was beautiful. That is, so let's give Jeff a hand. Thank you.